You are a Locked On Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And hello and welcome into the Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. Grant McCauley, Jake Mastriani with you as we head into the weekend. Another four-game series for the Braves. This one, though, it started out on the right note. Atlanta got the pitching it needed, and we're going to talk about what that looked like on this night because they did throw a shutout. They also got the runs they needed in a 7-0 victory over the New York Mets. We'll talk all about it, get you all of the big performers, some of the crazy stats that came out of this one, and, of course, we'll get you set up for the doubleheader that's happening on Saturday as these two teams will meet not once but twice as we head into the weekend. Before we get started, I want to remind you to subscribe to Lockdown Sports Atlanta right here on YouTube. Go ahead and smash that bell so you get notified every time we drop a new episode. And make sure you like this episode, leave a comment, tell a friend all those good things, and subscribe to Lockdown Braves wherever you get your podcast. Jake, I would say this one was a lot more like it after what has kind of been a sloppy up-and-down road trip. It wasn't perfect, but at the end of this one, I think you'll take a 7 nothing win 10 times out of 10. You will, and you said it wasn't perfect, and there have been times in the outing where things could have unraveled as they have the past week or so of the starting rotation, but it didn't, and we're able to put up a zero, and the offense continues to do what it's done all along. Yeah, Charlie Morton was the man on the mound, and he was having a little bit of trouble zeroing in, but he was throwing those zeros, and the Braves will take all of those they can get from any starting pitcher that wants to give them to him, and in game number 114, he gave them five of those zeros as he tossed five scoreless innings. Uh, the Braves with a 7 0 victory are now 73 and 41 on the season. 11 hits, no errors, and six men left on base for Atlanta. The Mets, meanwhile, 52 and 63. This is a very different meeting for these two clubs than any time previous this year, as the fortunes of the New York Mets certainly took a turn in 2023. They were shut out on seven hits, one error, 14 men left on base. You might be saying, seven hits and 14 men left on base. How's that happen? Well, it happened with a whole bunch of walks, seven of those belonging to Charlie Morton. We'll get into more of that in a moment. Uh, 0 for 12 with runners in scoring position. That also is going to be something that works against you if you're trying to break up a shutout. Mets unable to do it. Morton picks up the win with those five scoreless innings. He's 11 and 10, breaks his four-start losing streak. Tyler McGill takes the loss as the Braves were able to figure him out second time through the order. He's now 6 and 6. Two hours, 55 minutes time of game, 37,339. We're on hand to see it at City Field. And what they saw, Jake, was one of the most unique pitching lines I think we're going to find anywhere. I'll get to the Braves' offense in a moment because it more than carried its weight as it has throughout the course of this road trip and obviously all season long and all month long here in August. But five innings of three-hit ball for Charlie Morton. On the surface, you'll take that, but he really had to grind this thing out. Seven walks, four strikeouts, 105 pitches. I've got some stats and some feats that uh, this game uh, earned Charlie Morton as a result of that crazy line, but... What did you see out of Charlie, and how good was it to see a Braves starting pitcher make it through five scoreless innings? Because it feels like it's been quite a while. It was. Look, obviously not the outing that Charlie wants, and I wanted to listen to his post game, and I did, and he's talking about the fact he's just he's struggling to find that release point and that consistency, and obviously you can tell that by the amount of walks, and it seems to come and go. I mean, the Vogel bat at bat in the first inning – he struck him out with some really good curveballs that he placed really well right under the hands of Vogelbach. So it's there, but it's just it comes and goes, and that's kind of what he was talking about in his post game. But yeah. I'll say, look at this: the last time through the rotation, the Braves have starters have had these issues where they're giving up free passes or a plays not made. Most of the plays were made tonight, but they didn't let things unravel and get out of control and give up a three, four run inning. So. Look, I know it wasn't the start that Charlie wants, and you want him to find that command and that consistency with all of his pitches. But, I mean, he made pitches when he needed to to get out of jams. And I think that still speaks to Charlie and the guy that he is. He still has the stuff mm -hmm. to be able to get it done. It's really just for him all about control and consistency. Yeah, and there's nothing that you need, I think, to be more consistent about, mechanically speaking, than release point. I mean, you could nitpick just about everything's important. It all adds up. But when you do struggle with release point, you see the kind of deliveries and non-competitive pitches that we've seen at times from Charlie and that we saw most certainly in this start because he was having to kind of go back to the drawing board, just kind of figure out what works. It seemed like the Mets had two on and nobody out in virtually every inning because it seemed like they did or they actually did. Uh, some double plays helped out Charlie Morton. That was certainly something he needed to get through this one. And as you mentioned, the plays getting made behind him, that makes a big difference. I told you there are some interesting facts about this line. Again, five scoreless innings, but seven walks. First Braves pitcher ever to do that. 
Only the third pitcher with 105 pitches with 52 or fewer of those for strikes in baseball history. That according to Mark Bowman, who did a search on uh, the Stathead site on Baseball Reference. Uh, this is just the kind of obscure company that Charlie Morton joins. But again, and as I've said many times in many ways, never about a shutout win that you can win ugly, but you can't lose pretty. And the Braves and Charlie Morton will take this outing for what it is, but look to make those improvements as he goes back through. And it has felt like, Jake, for the last really month after coming out of the All-Star break, firing against the White Sox, he's been searching for it. And every start has been a grind. Tonight, he was just able to stay one step ahead of a New York Mets offense. It's not what it has been in the past. And it has been a grind for Charlie Morton. Even in some games this year where I think he has had it, it, it still has been a grind for him. The guy's 39. Everything's probably a grind for him at, at this point. But you'll take that if he can do that and give you five, hopefully more so six innings. And send him back out there for the six, which just says a lot about Charlie and also says a lot about where this pitching staff is right now. And he clearly didn't have it. Offense helps, obviously, when you got a big lead. But, you know, for him to just be able to grind through that, like I said, I think that's something for Charlie that he can at least take away from this and then continue to make those mechanical adjustments. He's not far off, in my opinion, mm -hmm. from getting back to being that Charlie that we know he can be. Yeah, I think he's proven it. He's got the track record, and you're going to try to ride with somebody like that and, and let him figure it out, and I think that he will. And, yeah, going back out there for the sixth inning, that speaks a lot to what the Braves have been dealing with with their starting pitchers, the lack of quality starts, the lack of innings they're getting out of them. And even if you send them back out there to go batter by batter, which I'm pretty sure was the case because we saw Pierce Johnson come right in, and I want to talk about him in a moment, you just wanted to give Charlie that opportunity to give you as much as he could because you got a doubleheader waiting for you on Saturday. Uh, Jake, Pierce Johnson was one of the early pickups for the Braves leading up to the trade deadline. It wasn't a deadline day deal for them but got him from the Colorado Rockies, got Brad Hand a little bit later. We saw him in this game. Uh, but Pierce Johnson now, another scoreless inning, seven and a third innings, five hits, one run allowed thus far in a Braves uniform. It was not earned. Three walks, 11 strikeouts since joining the Braves. I think this is exactly the kind of arm you needed to put in a bullpen that was very much searching for some guys to come in and give you some quality innings. You knew when they got him, he had a chance to kind of be a high leverage seventh, sixth, seventh inning kind of guy with the stuff he has. That curveball's really good. You saw that back to back at bats tonight where he struck out guys on three pitches and he's throwing mid to upper 90s. I mean, he has good stuff. This is certainly what the Braves were hoping they were going to get. So another guy that you can really start to depend on in those middle innings to kind of bridge that gap to, you know, Jimenez, Mentor, Iglesias on the back end. Yeah, he certainly is. It feels a little bit like the job that Luke Jackson had in the night shift where it wasn't necessarily he's going to throw the eighth inning every time. He's got the stuff to do it, and he's closed a little bit in the past. But for Pierce Johnson, you know, this is being able to add those layers of quality depth that the Braves bullpen very much needed. And we'll see if they're able to add a little bit more with some guys coming back from injuries. But both the guys they picked up from Colorado came in and tossed scoreless frames. Little bit of an injury scare for Brad Hand as he took one a liner off the inside of the knee stayed in it might have swelled up on him it seemed like he struggled a little bit after that but hopefully this is nothing that will keep him off the mound for very long because again you just got him you're trying to sort this thing out you don't need any pitching injuries at this point particularly in the bullpen you don't and interesting enough i feel like since he's come over he's only given up hits to lefties which is crazy because lefties are hitting under 200 against him in his <laughs> career but uh both nimmo and mcneil got him in this one they're both really good hitters just shot it back up the middle nimmo almost got him uh mcneil did hopefully he is okay i like the veteran there again more often than not, I think he's going to come in and do a good job against lefties. It just it feels like whatever for whatever reason when he's since he's joined the Braves, he's getting a lot of hit to lefties, a lot of hits to lefties here. But I really like the addition again, veteran lefty, going to come in some big spots to get some lefty bats. Yeah, and just important to get as many zeros as you could get on this night to keep this whole thing going, grab that first win of this series in the offense, put the Braves in position to do it. It was a big night for Austin Riley. He was three for four, hit his twenty seventh home run of the year. It seems like he loves hitting at City Field because he always seems to tee off on at least one or two in a series. A double, a couple runs knocked in, and a couple runs scored for him. But it was Eddie Rosario that got the Braves on the board on this night. And, Jake, we've talked a lot about some of the struggles for Eddie and for Marcel right in the middle of the order. Sean Murphy also hasn't been swinging it as well in the second half. But uh, two for four and a three-run single, a misplay in the outfield that uh, helped out but just allowed Eddie to reach second base. Uh, but three runs scoring on that play. Hopefully that's a sign that Eddie Rosario is starting to figure a few things out because we know he's come up with some big hits for the Braves in the past. This season, of course, uh, back in the postseason a couple of years ago, we'll see if Eddie's able to get things going. That would be a welcome sight down the stretch as well. It would be. It seems like every time we start to count Eddie out and talk about should he be in the lineup, this and that, he goes on a run. So maybe that's what we're seeing here because it has been a struggle 
for him lately. So again, he's somebody we know that can get hot and he can really have an impact in a hurry. We'd love to see obviously some more consistency out of that, but he does have some clutch hits in his career with the Braves. We all know that as well. So good to see him kind of get things going. Like you said, hopefully that kind of sparks him down the stretch here, continue to come with some big hits at the bottom of that order. Yeah, on a night where it was fairly quiet for Ron Lacuna Jr., even for Matt Olson, who did have a base hit. Acuna was on base, scored a run as well. It was Eddie Rosario coming through in a big spot. And, of course, Austin Riley has been on a home run binge over the past three or so weeks, or really since the All-Star break. He's pushed that batting average up into the 280s now, and I know we were looking for a long time to see when's Austin Riley going to get hot, but I think he's answered that question here in the second half, and that's another great development for the Braves lineup. Speaking of lineups, though, Jake, as I gave you those stats about Charlie Morton and those facts about the seven walks and five scoreless innings, how about this one I saw on Twitter from Optus Stats? Mets are the only team in the modern era, that's since 1900, to have seven-plus hits and nine-plus walks and not score a run in a game. That doesn't even seem like it's a thing that should be possible because of all those base runners, but 14 left on base, 0 for 12, and the double plays they hit into is what kept the Mets off the board. It certainly did. And like I said, I mean, you got to give some credit to Charlie here. He made some big pitches when he had to to get out of jams. Got a big double play from Mendick there early in the game. He obviously had some big strikeouts as well. So, again, I know that Mets lineup's kind of depleted after the All-Star break and or after the trade deadline. They got some young guys in there. But, again, as, as much of a struggle as it was for Charlie, I still feel like he made some really good pitches when he had to to keep the Mets off the board. Yeah, and I think it's important to you know have those performances – However you can get them, again, they don't have to be the best looking. They just have to be efficient or at least effective enough to help you win a baseball game. And Charlie Morton was able to help the Braves do that. Unfortunately, the Phillies also won a baseball game on Friday, so they remain nine and a half games behind the Braves in the National League East standings. That race, though, feels pretty static, and the Braves are winning just enough and trying to figure a few things out in this offense. Again, to go back to that, is scoring now an average of about six runs per game, even though Atlanta hasn't been playing extremely well by their record over the course of the month of August, which, of course, we're just kind of getting into that midway point. Maybe it's just one of those lulls, those dog days of summer type things for the Braves to kind of figure out. But Atlanta able to hold on uh, just enough to keep, of course, this division race uh, right where they want it and to improve to 32 games over 500 again, which feels like about where they've been since going on that great run through the month of June. We'll talk a little bit about the doubleheader, which is coming your way on Saturday. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you about one of our great sponsors here, on the show, and it is, of course, Sleeper, as this episode of the Braves Postcast is brought to you by Sleeper. So if you want the chance to win more money with less picks, you need to head to Sleeper where you can win up to 100 times your money with just two or more fantasy baseball picks. Sleeper is now offering a 100-time payout for up to an eight-pick contest. You can choose as many as eight players as you like, pick more or less on your favorite baseball stats like home runs, strikeouts, hits, whatever it is that uh, you really want to see that night. Well, Sleeper's got it for you. Use the promo code Locked On and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. Currently operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today. The Braves, meanwhile, will try to get as much sleep as they can prior to playing two games on Saturday. It'll get started at 1.10 p.m. We expect that Alan Winans will get that start in that opener, while Spencer Strider will be starting in the second contest. Uh, we know the history between Strider and the Mets. It has not always been on the right-hander's side. He's 12-4 and four on the year, trying to keep that ERA under four and maybe toss a good performance against a less mighty Mets lineup. And for Alan Winans, it's a really interesting one, Jake, I think, because he's a guy that got Rule 5 by the Braves from the Mets. Now he's going to City Field to make just a second career start and do so against the team that originally drafted him. Looking forward to seeing Winings again. I thought he did pretty well in his first outing. Obviously, probably got to be a little bit careful with him going through a lineup a third time as they were in that first outing. But I thought there were some good things in there, good breaking balls, able to keep hitters off balance. For Strider, I know he's struggling right now. He probably doesn't want to see this Mets team, which seems to get under his skin at times. But need a good performance out of him because you don't, again, like I said, I don't know if you're going to let Winans go through a lineup a third time. I don't know how long he's going to be able to go in that first game. So you're really hoping and banking on Strider kind of being back to more himself this one, working into the sixth, seventh inning for the Braves in that nightcap. But always oh, a good day for the Braves. Again, excited to see what Winans can do. I think there's an opportunity for him in this rotation, uh, perhaps down the road if he can pitch well in this one. So looking forward to see what both of these pitchers can do. As you know, Braves starting pitching right now, trying to get on track. Hopefully they can begin that on Saturday. Yeah, and you'll take all the help you can get. And I do think, and there's been a lot of conversation, obviously, about the Braves rotation, the struggles, how to fix it, how to help different guys. Winans has had a very nice year in AAA. If he's able to come up and give somebody a break at some point, 
this might be an opportunity to continue to audition for, as you said, more starts and more opportunities. So we'll see how that all shakes out. Uh, but the Braves deciding to go with that young righty in game one of the doubleheader against the Mets, Spencer Strider in game two, as these two clubs will meet for that twin bill at City Field. First pitch of game one is at 110. It'll be a 715 nightcap for the two clubs as they play, not once but twice on Saturday and continue this four game series uh, up at City Field. That'll bring us to the end of this edition of the Braves Postcast. As always, we appreciate you riding along with us. Make sure you subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta here on YouTube. Click the bell so you get notified every time we drop a new episode. Click that like button, tell a friend, leave us a comment. We appreciate all those. And make sure you subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcast. Once again, the Braves with a 7-0 shutout win over the New York Mets to open up a four-game series. We'll be back at you after the two games on Saturday. For Jake Mastriani, I'm Grant McCauley. We will catch you next time. And until then, so long, everyone.